I think that's true. I think that's true. Um, however, I would say, I, I hope that we just, I hope what we're doing now is we're extending our possibilities. I think that's what I, I feel that's what we're doing, we should be doing. Um, and, you know, even as we speak, you know, we've just completed, just completed, as in last week, um, a series for, of Shaw the Sheep, which has been, you know, paid for by BBC and, and many, many other broadcasters around the world. So that also works and it's very important to us. So I hope, it's, I, I'm delighted by the idea of uh, targeting the market exactly, you know, you know, so, so that mm -hmm. we can, we can show our work like this on, online, on YouTube, that's great, you know, conventional broadcasters, yes, absolutely, uh, and then in the movie theatres as well. So that seems to be a strong position. And I guess probably the, over the next uh, decade, the, the, the trick for us is to keep light on our feet, to, to, to be able to cross media. You know, of course, everyone's talking about these, these um, transmedia things. It's a very it's an interesting word and an interesting world. And I hope that maybe, the, whereas with the angry Kim, we, we did those short films, we put them out, and that was great, the end of the story. Now with Morph, I hope the who is an old character, God knows, but I hope we're embarking on a new, a whole new way of representing him that might involve, you know, games as well. You know, might involve games, might involve um, certainly the one-minute films we're making now, but that, that leaves the possibility open in the future. Yeah, we could go back to TV, you know, conventional conventional broadcasting for um, a series of five-minute episodes if, if we have the creative. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I would have thought the gaming aspect would be definitely a, a huge uh, potential for you guys, especially with the interactive medium, kind of the, the exact medium of clay being so malleable as it is. If you can get into, yeah. into tablet, the world of tablets and start allowing yeah, people to yeah. create characters for, the, for an Ardman world, I mean, I'd, I'd love to see something that go, like that go live. Yeah, you're right, and, and I do love that look, by the way. I love, you know, those projects where they use real tangible 3D. Yeah. I mean, here I'll just pick it up, I'll just pick it up, yeah. Real tangible 3D objects in, in, the, in the gaming world. I love that look. I yes, don't feel yeah. like for the moment I'm a, I'm a gamer, because I'm not, but lots of guys here are. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm very happy, to, I'm very happy to let them take a great lead on that. Yeah. No, sure, it's, sure. It's, 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 I love watching it. I love the looks, and, mm. it, and it seems, you know, I mean, it fits in with technology as well. This is some, uh, you know, there are, there are different ways of shooting your material. Um, we've been experimenting. Oh, I don't know. I can't even think. It's, it's like it's like Flash Plus, but with uh, I can't remember. I can't remember what it's called. But using um, you can you can take three D objects and manipulate them much as you would manipulate Flash, except they're they're three D. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. When I say 3D, when I say 3D, I mean real 3D, because it's, the, the, te the terminology is so confusing that so many people always mm. say 3D when they're referring to CG, and I always think of 3D, I think Actual. that's 3D. Yeah, that's yeah. I'm <laughs> well, I'm actually glad that you uh, lifted Morph up there, because I think one of the things, that the, the tactile nature of something that is so real, uh, yeah. it, it, you do, you know, when you actually see thumbprints in the clay, you, you create a very strong association to it. So now if you're going to be rolling out a series of it, how do you, how do you update an icon that you've created but still keep him relevant? Yes, so that's a fair question. I mean, I'm very concerned about that. I'm very aware of that because I don't want to just, you know, that there, are, there are phrases that people use that I would never use, like, you know, like you know, warming him up again, bringing him back. And I, I, I don't want to think in those terms even. Um, the, I think I think the answer lies in storytelling. Absolutely, I think that my my philosophy is that, that we will take the material and the medium as seriously as we ever have, and trust that the audience enjoy it as they always have. You know, trust that the audience cares about how it's made because because we do. Um, but then the stories can, by all means. We need to update them. We, we, we just do. You know, I don't mean... I want to say update them. Um, I don't mean you have to strive for, for gimmicks. I think, frankly, 
in perfectly honest, you need young people to come help write the stories so that the things that they're talking about continue to be relevant. Because, like, you know, how, you know, Morph is, let's face it, more than 35 years old, right? So, so the things that, if, if I did a, a story 35 years ago where Morph made a, um, he sort of made himself a biplane out of stuff he found on the tabletop. But all the all the visual references, all, all the materials he used made sense then exactly. Um, I would just I'd like somebody, you know, somebody younger to come up with a storyline. Storyline. The way they react, the characters can stay true, I think. Because I think there's a there's a simple, natural organic relationship, especially Morph and Chaz, the way those two guys play with each other, relate to each other, is really, really true. So we'll keep yeah. that. Mm. But the things they're doing can afford to change a bit, and you have to you know, acknowledge that they're, they're in the digital world. You know, you know, I'm sure they're both, they both have Facebook accounts, perhaps they're competitive about the number of friends they have, this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well that, that is interesting, because then that leads me to you know, originally Morph had paintbrushes and sharpeners as his props. Yeah. So, will we do we expect to see him with an Instagram account and doing Yelp reviews and kind of keeping in touch with his audience beyond his broadcast well, times? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do. I mean, I hope I get away with both. That's my hope. Um, you know, um, um, in the past, historically, he. He lived on the table of Tony Hart, who was an artist. That was where he lived. Now, um, Tony Hart's passed on. I'm very, very sorry to have to say. Mm. So that's not going to happen exactly. So what, we've discussed this a lot. And our conclusion is that, um, that Wolf, who is in some happy way in Wolf, has come to li live in our studio, okay. at the Art Man studio. And um, that's good because it, the Art Man studio has, in a way, it has naturally exactly this, uh, what you're talking about. You've got, you know, um, on the studio floor where the animators live, this is where I'm thinking he lives now, there will be a desk, and the desk has clay, sharp knives, paintbrushes, wood glue, stuff like that, because that's because we make real things. Um, then it, but it also has, it has, often it's got the guy's, um, Smartphone is there, you know, the guy, the music's there, there'll be a computer there. So I, I, I would just want to be, I don't want to rule out any of those, I don't want to rule out any modern references. In fact, I'm inclined to have to rule them in. But on the other hand, there, there's an attraction in the analog world because it's more tangible. Mm -hmm. And so paint is more fun, more messy to play with than a uh, the wake up tablet, you know. So I sure. do both. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Do you yeah. think? Do you do you think uh, Morph would ever kind of go beyond just being a entertaining character? Would he ever go into kind of uh, social issues? And would we see like a spin off educational channel from him or something like that? Well, no, that that is that uh, that I haven't considered. To be honest, no, there's many things we have considered. That I haven't considered. It's it's. Interesting, isn't it? There's always this interesting thing with language with him. Lack of language is, is a bit of an issue when it, comes, yeah. when it comes to communication, although he communicates his feelings very well. Yeah, um, yeah I, don't know. I, I don't know about that one. I mean, my mind is wide open, absolutely mm. wide open. That's, and, you know, I'm trying, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that, that I'm really embracing the ideas of the, the younger generation that work here at Artman. The, the, the filmmakers, the animators, the writers, the storytellers. I'm embracing their ideas. And really, if someone's got a good vision for him, I'm very, very happy to follow. You know, I, I, I'm, you know I'm, I love the character. I care about him very much. Um, I trust him. I believe in him. You know. But uh, I don't... And I feel... I, I feel like it's... Like my, my job is... Is as simple as saying, yes, he could do that, or no, he wouldn't do that. Maybe that's it. And, and, let, um, and this part, of course, now again, back to Kickstarter, you know, we're, once we've got our backers in place, we're absolutely going to be approaching them for, for ideas. 
exactly what form those ideas come in. I don't know. I'm trying now. I'm trying today to compose stuff to say to those bankers how they might put in their ideas because it's not you know it's not entirely obvious to most people. Mm. Um, and yeah, th- this idea of, of the whole world you know coming into us rather, rather than the old, old style of broadcasting where you you just sit in your ivory tower and broadcast to the world. Now, yeah, now yeah. the world coming into us is great. Exactly, yeah, and it does it does enable you to have to not only crowdfund projects but also to crowdsource ideas and get get yes. uh, the, the best creative in the world out there, which I think is yeah. that's that's the merit the, or the benefit of a meritocracy. Yeah. So, Peter, a while ago you said that uh, the animation animation comes to life from four parts: that being the writer, the director, the voice voice artist, and the animator. Yeah. What do you see yourself as in this particular role? Uh, well, that's that is interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> yes, that is interesting. Because so far, for the Kickstarter, I've been directing, really. Yeah. Um, which I love to do. Um, whether I would ever animate again, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I've tried. Uh, and the fact is, the young guys are much better than I am. That's the yeah. That, yeah. Yes, so that makes me hesitate. It, like, it, I'm very tempted to do some pieces, very, very tempted. Um, but that, but it's hard to find the time for that yeah. as well. So I guess directing, uh, directing is the main thing I would do, yes. Um, voice talent is, is interesting with more films because with more, uniquely and historically, the voice comes afterwards. Everything else we do, mm. the, the voice is always the first thing you record. Uh, and only with Morph, and this is, as I say, it's, it's historical, only with Morph does he animate first and then someone um, tries to sort of sync it up afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and I'll stick with that. I mean, you could you could say that the other way of working is more rational. But, I, but the way I'm talking about um, has energy to it. And I'm, and I'm interested, in, one thing I am, to is not get bogged down. You know? When I did Morph back in the day, like 35 years ago, when I was animating it, it was te- it was amazingly low tech, you know, and it was just me and Plasticy and the tabletop. Didn't even have um, any video playback, so, I, mm. so the film, the animation was recorded blind into the camera, and I never knew what I was doing until two days later when I saw the film developed. Um, mm. Now, I don't want to do that anymore. That's, that's, not, that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I have a suspicion about the way we're working getting so sort of complicated, so perfectionist, is it, that we go really slowly. Because I believe we're working fast. So, um, what was I saying? Oh, yes. If we start, if we start pre-recording more and then syncing up his lips to, to the pre-recorded voice, I think that would slow the whole thing down. I'm keen not to do that. So we'll keep on the... The old style, whereby the voice is kind of slightly approximate, but it always was, and it kind of works, you know, it just kind of works. We've had fun doing it, the yeah, voice. Yeah. It's, just, it's, a, it's a ridiculous part of the process. And uh, there's, there's not a hell of a lot of information on the net about this particular fact, but who is the voice behind Morph, the original Morph? Very good question. There, there is, and yeah, I can tell you, the original voice is a guy called Peter Harwood, okay. and he uh, is still going. Um, he wasn't even the specialised voice artist. He was a he was a, a sound editor at BBC, and he did it. He he invented the voice. Um, right. So we're going to sit and go back to him. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it'd be fun to go back to him. Yeah. Excellent. And I mean, is it is it a matter of somebody's voice recorded and then they, you're speeding that up, or are there are a whole lot of tricks that we don't know about? It's, it is like you know what it sounds like. Actually, it's just like what it sounds like. Yeah. Which is uh, the only thing which is the the, the art is. The noises he makes at real speed, that's the art of the thing. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So it, yeah, to sound exactly like Morph. So he has to speed. So because it's going to be speeded up, and this is how it's done on tape, you know, you know, again, 35 years ago, real old technology, it yeah. was speeded up and of course it pitched up. So um, so he does pitch up, but he, he would pitch his voice down. He would pitch his voice down so that it would, so it would pitch up less, but it would spread up and make a series of strange. Noises which I will not imitate. Sorry, <laughs> as, as morphs, not 
boys. Yeah, uh, excellent. Okay. And uh, one uh, one other thing, um, can we expect a, a tip of the hat to Tony Hart? I mean, uh, the, especially those of us in South Africa know him very well as the the introducer to the Morph series. So yes. kind of he's he's one and the same. His spirit certainly lives on in it. Could we w- yes. will we expect to see a claymation version of him somewhere in it? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? We'll have to we'll have to do something. We will have to we'll have to we'll have to acknowledge him properly. You're right. Mm. See, that's a good one. That's good. That's just the sort of thing we can get the community talking about. Actually, we'll have to acknowledge him properly somehow, um, because you know he was he's so associated with Morph, and he was terribly. Um, he's such a nice, a lovely guy. You know, lovely, lovely guy. And he was always rather apologetic with us because he got all the credit for Morph, which we <laughs> yeah, embarrassed of about. And it used to say in. I think they changed it. In, in, like in Trivial Pursuits, one of the questions was, you know, who's the little bastard in men created by Tony Hart? You know, well, <laughs> so, and he was embarrassed by that very generously, you know. Yeah. Um, but we completely associate with him, and, you know, there's no doubt, there's no doubt that Morph's character came from him to some extent because he was the straight man, you know, and, and the, the, you know, it, you know, a funny man needs a straight man. So, um, I, I mean, I think, I hope that Morph's now, you know, had long enough to grow up and get, to get his own act that doesn't need Tony. But we do a, over a lot, and I'd like to pay full tribute to him. You know, okay, some. exciting to hear. Peter, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. We'll nice talk to you soon. See you. Cheers.